Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third session of the Fundamentals of Donut Economics with Kate Rayworth. We want to just give you a brief update that uh, we're now well beyond 350 uh, students enrolled in uh, over 50 countries around the world. And we were just uh, noting, uh, as you've been uh, saying hello in the chat, uh, just how extraordinary it is that we can all be sitting in our living rooms or in a cafe and be live with people all over the world simultaneously and it it actually works <laughs> we we all have our uh, experiences with zoom but i mean it's just it's an amazing thing so i just want to welcome uh, everyone in the spirit of the miracle of uh, technology today uh, and to uh, say that you know, we're really considering, and I'll be talking more next week, uh, but just to, uh, so people can start putting it on their calendars, one week after Kate's final session, we're going to have an open house. So we'll be sending everybody a special email, but if you want to put uh, uh, this time, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, uh, the Wednesday uh, uh, two weeks time, um, uh, we want to have an open house where we really want to go into detail about the uh, Masters in Regenerative Action, other courses that we want to uh, be scheduling to uh, make you aware of, uh, because the whole purpose of, of Kate's course is not only to inform you about the fundamentals of donut economics, which is taking the world by storm uh, due to its uh, brilliant simplicity and deep and profound message around uh, aligning human affairs with planetary uh, ecosystems. Uh, but uh, we also are launching a whole new kind of MBA program. And uh, we want to have as many students as possible come together in pods uh, to study together uh, as we uh, progress with other faculty and possibly uh, other courses by Kate and the folks associated with the uh, Donut uh, Experimental Action Lab. So welcome everyone uh, to our third uh, session uh, with Kate. And Kate, I turn the program now over to you. Thanks, Jim. And welcome back, everybody. Uh, really glad to be here today. It's funny, we're, I feel like we're, 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 we've become a group, we're hitting our stride, and then it's that feeling of, oh, but this is the third or fourth. So it's that it's actually very fitting because, of course, it's just been the summer solstice or the winter solstice, depending on where you are. And it's that moment of the, the fullest, most breath of the earth or, the, or the, the breathing out, again, depending on where you are. So just reflecting on those passing points. So lovely to be here today and lots to address, lots to cover. So I'm going to share my screen as I always do. And take us straight to business in every sense of the word. So can business get into the donut? Let's just bring ourselves here because I know that everyone's just turned up from all sorts of different places and activities, rushing in the morning, in the evening, coming from meetings, conversations. So let's just arrive here again and start back with the donut as a possibility of a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century, where we aim to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And we know that we are very far from that right now, just from this one little snapshot. So let's remind ourselves that last century's economic theories and governmental policies and business models were not designed to solve for this. They were not designed with this understanding or indeed with this purpose. So we should just not expect them to take us there. That would be insane. We have to come up with new economic theories, new governmental policies and new business models. And I should add finance models too if we're going to give ourselves a chance of actually turning the dynamics of this story around. So what then happens when business meets the donut? I've had conversations with so many companies ever since the donut first was published in 2012. 
And I'm going to share with you some of that and some of the tools that we've created at Dunlop Economics Action Lab today. I'm also going to invite people to share from your experience. I mean, you're going to have a lot of time in the breakout groups, but I'm going to invite people to share. So please think of your own experience from within enterprises, within businesses that you know well, if you would like to share some of those insights. What we're going to cover today, when business meets the donut, we're going to start with what I call the corporate to-do list. What's business going to do when it encounters this challenge and context of the world? We're going to talk about what it means to move towards regenerative and distributive design in the field of business. We'll then look into the deep design of business itself. We're not talking about the product design, we're talking about the enterprise design. Then you're going to go into breakout discussion groups and we're going to have 30 minutes today because I think there's just so much going to come up and that people can share from their own experience that I want you to have a real chance to do that and we'll share back from some of those ideas that come out. And then we're going to talk about deals business policy because this is really important for us. Um, it's, it's a really important part of me sharing this today and I'm doing this very uh, consciously, sharing these ideas and yet also sharing the importance of handling our intention to be open with our commitment to the integrity of the ideas. So I will be talking about deals business policy and what can and can't be done with these tools right now and how we're planning on opening that up over time. So that's the journey we're gonna go on. Let's go. So here we are. This is, this is business as usual. This is what we've inherited. We have inherited a world, an industrial system where degenerative design of enterprise is normal, where we take again and again and again from the sources of the living world. And we throw our waste again and again and again into Earth's sinks, into Earth's spaces where we think we can put waste, whether it's plastics in lakes and rivers or electronic waste in the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people. And I look at these images, mining, deforestation, dumping. And I think our children's children will pull these images from the archive and tap us on the shoulder and say, did you know about this? Did you ever see anything like this? Because they will find it absolutely extraordinary that we thought this was normal, because we do. They'll find it extraordinary that this is what it meant to do business. And thank goodness they will find it extraordinary because it must be transformed by the time that they are experiencing business and enterprise in the world. So we've run down Earth's life support systems with the way we do business. We also run down people, we exploit, and we've inherited industrial structures of which one of the major stories is that story of exploitation. Whether it's women workers who find that they are sacked if they are pregnant and are forced to prove every month that they are not pregnant, whether it's workers in incredibly exploitative condition along with children in cobalt mines and lithium mines, whether it's people who are working for some of the world's largest companies and find that they are made redundant or the company might be taking um, furlough money but not passing it on to them and doing massive payouts to its owners or its shareholders or indeed just avoiding paying tax altogether. The indignation of people about the relationships between businesses and their employees, their customers, their communities, the societies on which they depend. Deeply divisive enterprise is, fills the newspapers every day. This is what we've inherited. So this is what has to be transformed. And that is either utterly overwhelming and it can make us incredibly angry or it can be utterly exciting because it, we know it's work that must be done. So what happens when we invite business to the donut table? As I mentioned, ever since the donut diagram came out in 2012, I've been having conversations with companies. I was invited at the Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership first to present there to some of the world's biggest companies. I found myself in the room with senior managers from around the world of multinational corporations. And it was just fascinating listening to their responses when I showed this image, showed the overshoot. And how does business respond? What does business think it needs to do? 
in response to this vision of our context. Tells us a lot. So over the years, I listened to how different enterprises were responding. And I'm talking about moving from a three people social enterprise startup to a major multinational Fortune 500 company across that spectrum. What's business gonna do? And I drew up what I call the corporate to-do list. The first response on the corporate to-do list is the oldest. It's do nothing. And it goes like this, well, that's a sorry story. Oh, that's a really shocking picture. But the business of business is business, as Milton Friedman nearly told us in the 1970s. And everything we're doing is nearly legal. So we're just going to carry on until the cost of the fines exceeds the benefits of this business model. And there's still plenty of businesses around who operate just like that today. And of course, that has to be shut down. The first step on where many companies, I think, are, is to say, well, ooh, that's a challenge. We will do what pays now. So if it pays to cut our carbon emissions, because actually it turns out you get massive savings in your supply chains. Why well, have empty lorries driving up and down? Be smarter with your supply chain logistics. You can actually save money as you cut carbon. So if we'll save money when we cut carbon, we'll do that because that pays now. If we will get a new access to market share because we take on a green certification, we'll do that because that pays now. So we'll do what pays now. It begins to move in the right direction. It's more ecological, it's more socially minded, but it's nothing like the speed and scale of transformation that we already know is required. It's still caught up in the short term financial returns, the short term business case. Show me the business case, they'll say. So we need to move on from this. Now, the next step up is a little more interesting and it was quite dominant in the last decade. We'll do our fair share. For about 10 years, especially when climate change awareness began to rise, you heard quite a number of companies and it was clearly a movement, companies seeing, oh, others are doing this, we'll do this too. They'd say, our national government has committed to cutting its carbon emissions nationally by 20% over the next 20 years. So we'll do our fair share. We'll cut 20% over the next 20 years. And this fair shareism, it's a step forward, but it very rarely adds up. As anybody knows who has been to a restaurant with friends and everyone's chipping in what they think is their fair share of the bill, it's pretty dangerous to be the person left holding that platter to give to the waiter at the end of the evening because it often just doesn't add up. And that not adding up is what we've seen going on in climate change negotiation by the world's governments, say, for many decades. We'll do our fair share when you do your fair share, but you're not doing your fair share. And I think companies also watch each other about what's normal, what's expected, what's required, what's OK to get away with. And our fair share seems to be just a reflection of the, our national government's inadequate commitment to What's got more interesting in recent years, though, is that the science has come along and said, oh, you want to do your fair share? I've got news for you because we need to get to net zero carbon. So it's going to turn out that your fair share actually kicks you up to the next level of ambition. You need to do net zero, by the way, when it comes to climate change. And of course, this is what we hear many companies talking about now. We're committed to an emission zero, zero carbon emissions in our global supply chains, net. The question is by when? Is it 2050, 2040, 2030, 2025? But zero polluting waste water leaving our factories. Zero dirty air going out into the city. Zero child labor in our supply chains. Zero accidents in our factories. Now this is transformative because business was never done like this before. So this is to be recognized. This is transformative. But in the words of the regenerative designer, Bill McDonough, why stop there? Why aim to be 100% less bad? We're going to do absolutely no bad. Why would you do that? He says, why not break through the ceiling of your imagination and actually aim to do good? To be generous, to be generative, to be positive. Some people call it net positive. And this I'm going to call do the donut. Because if we're going to get into the donut, we have to be, bring positive contribution. We are already so far out of it. It's no good just to do no harm. We need to actually move back into it. So you could say, be generous, be generative, be positive, be contributive. 
But some enterprises I've, I've been really struck over the years, showing them the donut, they'll literally rush up and say, but, but that could be our logo. I mean, that just encapsulates why we exist. We're just using business as a vehicle because we think it's an effective vehicle for achieving that purpose we have in the world. But that's why we exist. And yet there's companies all the way up and down this corporate to-do list, which in itself is fascinating. How can it be that there's such a wide range of enterprises on this corporate to-do list? Now, let me add some specificity of well, what would it mean to do the donut? Like, what are we talking about here? And so I'm going to just go in one level of detail. And of course, yeah, I couldn't, uh, spoiler alert, I'm not gonna tell you, here's a company that's doing the donut. I don't know of one. I haven't gone through the process of, of fully assessing one yet, but there's no company I'm going to show you here today that I've seen that's doing the donut. What I'm gonna show is companies that through their intention and through the action are clearly aiming to move towards doing this. And I think that's the point. We're on this journey of redesigning business and we're moving towards in that direction. So. How can business actually aim to do the donut? If we are so far out, so much red of humanity falling short, so much ecological overshoot, business that aims to do the donut is business that's going to actually act to bring us back within. It's going to be a return journey into some place. And it needs to be regenerative and distributive by design. And of course, these concepts are familiar from last week when we talk about cities, but I believe these are the two dynamics that run through all of the transformations that we need to make in cities, in governmental policies, and in business and in communities become regenerative and distributive by design. So let me dive in and give some examples of what this means. Let's start with degenerative enterprise. We've looked at some already. It runs down Earth's life support systems. We mine and mine and log and log and we use things often only once and then throw them away into lakes and rivers, into the atmosphere. This is how we run down the life support systems of planet Earth. This is how we systematically push ourselves over planetary boundaries and run down the local ecosystems in which communities and societies live. And we need to transform that, bend those linear degenerative arrows into circular regenerative ones so that these resources are not used up, they're used again and again, so that we begin to do business running on Earth's solar and current energy. We begin to do business while recognizing that the waste from one process becomes food for the next. We separate the biological and the technical materials. So nature's materials, nature of course, breaks things down and restores them. That's how she works. That's why life on this planet continually regenerates. And we need to learn to mimic that with human made materials from plastics to ceramics to synthetics, keep them separate so that we can mimic that and create business models that mimic that loop and not throwing anything away. That is how we can begin to restore and work within the cycles of the living world. So, Going one step deeper, it's not just about being sustainable. And I find this frame from the carpet company interface a really nice heuristic for thinking about this. So we've inherited degenerative designs where factories are smokestacks polluting the sky, where the logical norm is to take, make and waste, and where we produce carbon intensive products. To move to sustainable, you could say, is to say, well, we need factories to go to zero. There's your mission zero zero emissions. We need to close the loop. So any materials that a company uses, they say, bring them back to us. Let's close that loop and bring them back. And then let's create low carbon products or even zero carbon products. But to move the next stage, they propose it means to have factories as forests. And I'll say a little bit more about this, that actually rather than polluting or doing zero harm, what if factories actually are generative as the forest next door? returning products from dispersed materials. So recognizing again, that we're already in overshoot. There are plastics in the oceans. There is carbon, excessive carbon in the atmosphere. There are all sorts of materials that have been dispersed carelessly into the world. And business needs to be part of actually gathering them and reintegrating them into the cycles to which they belong. And then creating products that don't release carbon or none, but actually sequester carbon, just as nature does say in coral reefs. So. This is a beginnings again, of a, I wouldn't say this is the ultimate definition of regenerative, but it's the really nice, useful beginnings of, aha, from degenerative to sustainable to regenerative. Here's a few examples from enterprises that I believe are intentionally moving towards regenerative design. 
So sanitary toilets recognize that in many parts of the world, there are no toilets in communities. And it's a huge lack of privacy, of um, dignity, of hygiene, huge vulnerability of the population. So they set up these micro enterprises throughout communities surrounding Nairobi. And the idea is that for the first part time, people can have access to a toilet. It gives dignity, cleanliness and sanity, which of course improves health in the community immediately. But also that waste is collected every day and it's turned back into compost, which is then reapplied to the fields. So at the technical level, they are closing the nutrient loop. But at the social level, you can see it's creating enterprise, bringing health and reconnecting the urban with the rural. Another very different model is Fair Phone Company that set up a, a phone company to say, if we are going to create and um, reduce our impact in the living world, so massively reduce our use of Earth's materials, we need to create products that enable the resources embedded in those phones to be used again and again and again. And the way we're going to do that is go for open modular design. So if you have a fair phone, it can be unscrewed by you, the customer and owner. There's a video on YouTube telling you how to replace the battery, how to upgrade the camera, how to fix broken parts. So the intention is to make open modular phones so that it can be part of an ecosystem of modular design. Far, it, it's ending the, the inbuilt obsolescence and actually intending for reuse. Another example is the Swedish sportswear company Houdini. So all of the clothing that they make is made either from wool and tensile, both of which are organic fibers, or recycled nylon and recycled polyester. They don't blend them, they don't mix them, they don't make complex interwoven fibers because you can't separate them out again. So they keep them apart. And with the nylons and polyesters, they, again, they'll, they'll reuse them and re-embed them in their products with the wool and tensile as a way of demonstrating to customers the recyclability and the re regenerative nature of these products. They literally said, bring them back to us. They started composting them, some of them in, in, a, in a big uh, horticultural garden in, in Stockholm, Com turning that clothing literally into compost, growing vegetables on top, and then serving it as a meal to some of their customers and saying, look, you're literally eating your old ski wear. Now, of course, this is a brilliant piece of performance art and, and performance messaging about regenerative design, that the materials of your clothing are organic and returned to earth systems. And then the last one I'll share here is interface itself. So their concept of saying, what would it mean for our factory to be as generative as the wildland next door? And this is their work with the biomimicry designer, Janine Benyus, whose organization Biomimicry 3.8, as in nature has been innovating for 3.8 billion years. There's probably quite a lot to learn from there. So if Janine were working with a company at like interface, she'd say, right, take me to the wildland next door. Let's go to, hectares of this land in which this forest is situated and you can probably hear now echoes of the city portrait let's go to the wildland next door let's actually take the metrics of this wildland it's ecological generosity how much carbon does this land store in a hectare how much groundwater does it store after a storm how much biodiversity and many species are housed here how much does this land cool the air on a hot day from the treetops to the forest floor how much does it build soil and these metrics that we measure on the wildland next door become the ecological performance standards. This is what nature can do here. This is nature's genius in this place. Let's take those ecological performance standards and make them the aspirational standards for our factory. So what would it mean for this factory as it's making carpets to be as generous as the wildland next door? How could it store carbon? How could it hold groundwater and a welcome biodiversity and cool the air what would it look like to actually belong as a factory so that it becomes functionally indistinct in terms of ecological generosity to the wildland next door now that's ongoing work and if you're interested i recommend having a look on some of the interviews that have been uh, on that have been shared about this and, and videos on the internet because it's really interesting ambitious work again very much moving towards what what is that going to look like and how close can you get towards actually matching or exceeding the generosity of the wildland next door. So there's some four examples of companies that are on the move towards regenerative design. But we also have to think of that other dynamic because we know that we've inherited enterprises that are often totally intentionally divisive by design. 
that aim to capture as much value as possible for the owners of the enterprise. Indeed, they say, but that's the, that's the purpose. That's our culture. That's our norm. That's success. That's the law. Is that the law? And there's a big debate in some places. Is that the law? That you must maximize shareholder returns that is your fiduciary duty or is that become a corporate norm and this may vary of course across jurisdictions but this has become a norm and the bookshops are full of the biographies of ceos who have done this in an exemplary way and who've delivered massive share value for their shareholders and their owners but we need a different kind of enterprise we need enterprises that actually aim to share the value that's created with all who co-created it. And that's a far, far greater number of people than the owners. In fact, many people would argue, if you really want to look for the people who created value, you don't go to the owners. They are, the, they may be shareholders or indeed share traders, but the ones who created that value are the works in the factory, the works in the fields and the supply chains. So what would it look like to create an enterprise that aims to create distributive value and think widely about opportunity and value because it can show up in many forms. Here's a few examples. So John Lewis, which is a major uh, store and supermarket in the UK, has a employee profit share scheme because it doesn't have um, employees. Actually, everybody who works there is called a partner. All of, its, all of the people who work for the company, whether it's the CEO or the person who delivers the box on your doorstep. And at the end of the year, they uh, have a profit share. This person is holding up this, the 17% saying this year, it's 17% of your salary profit share. So the money made is returned to those who are employed within the company. Of course, that's a very powerful way of distributing value created amongst those who are employed in the company. But of course, the people who created the value that is sold in John Lewis stores goes far, far beyond the immediate employees. The people who picked the food, who made the clothing, who made the homewares on the other side of the world. One model that aims to go even further than that is El Puente, which is a, an association of craft producers and craft shops around the world. They have not only um, profit share amongst the, the, the um, producers, but a governance share. So they share the value of making decisions amongst all of their organizations. So it's, it's very owned in a very, very grounded way. So distributive ownership amongst all of those who create value in those supply chains. Another example, going back to Houdini. So Houdini say, you know, we want to see the world become regenerative by design. And there's no way that one company at a time is going to do it. In fact, we're never gonna get there if we carry on doing business in siloed uh, industrial systems, each company with its own loop its own products, its own secrets. So Houdini say, this is one of our top products. It's our hoodie. Here's the pattern. Here's exactly how we cut it out. And here's the details of every single piece of material and accessory that goes into making that. We bought this one here, it's called that. We bought that here, that here, so that you too can use it. And when Houdini innovate new fabrics and they produce very high end clothing. So they're often innovating, very soft, stretchy, new fabrics. They open source those fabrics. Whereas many companies would say, no, 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 this is our USP. This is exactly where we apply a patent. And this is our corporate secret. Houdini say, no, the opposite. We're never going to create a circular economy and an ecosystem of textile use and reuse if we do that. So here it is, this is the technology. Please, other people start using it and we can begin to create an ecosystem. The last example I'll share here is Lush, the cosmetics company that make all sorts of kinds of smelly soaps and many more things. Lush is one of the few companies that I know of in the UK that signed up to the fair tax mark. What does that mean? It means they just signed up to make a commitment to say we commit to paying the right amount of tax in the right place at the right time. That sounds simple, but we know that many companies spend an awful lot of money with accountants and lawyers to ensure that they pay the least amount of tax in the fewest number of company countries as rarely as possible. So this is a recognition from companies that we depend upon a healthy society for our business to thrive. We are a member of society and we must give contribution back. And it's the opposite of saying, you know, corporate tax avoidance and evasion. We are going to sign up to pay fair tax where we do business. Again, these are just examples from specific companies, and I'm sure people can think of many, many more, towards with distributive design. They are just illustrations. So 
business that's regenerative by design and distributed by design. To me, this is what it means that business is moving towards saying we're aiming to do the donut. So let's come back to the corporate to-do list and what, what's a company going to do? And I've sat around the table with many companies and, and put this on the table and said, well, where are you? And it's just a fantastic conversation. And I recommend anybody who's involved inside a business to, to put this on the table and say, where are we? Because actually what you'll obviously find is that we're not in one place at all. That we're in many places all at once. So for example, some people might say, well, the CEO speaks as if we're aiming to do the donut, grand speeches. But actually middle managers are incentivized only to do what pays now. So there's a massive gap internally between what we say and what's actually going on inside the company. Or people might say, well, when it comes to climate change, we are absolutely publicly committed to mission zero, but ask me about child labor and I don't think we're doing anything on that. So picking off issues and acting only in certain areas. So I'm just gonna invite now People on this call, if you have experience from within a company of any kind, whether it's social enterprise or a multinational company, I'm not asking that you say the name, you can if you want, and if you think that's okay, you can, but I'm just gonna invite people who have experience with companies who'd like to, and find this a use for reflection. If you want to just pop a comment in the chat box and say, yeah, actually I could say something about a company that I work in or have worked in, that, and I could just, unmute for a moment and I'll invite you to and just say something in relation to this list so can I ask that we stay with this because we, we could obviously go off sideways in so many directions but to stay here anybody who thinks yeah I could say something interesting about a company that that's in a split position on this list so does anybody want to offer a comment here I'm going to watch the chat box and see if anybody does. Oh, uh, Caroline is offering a fossil fuel company. Caroline, if you're offering to talk about a fossil fuel company or you're, you're hoping a fossil fuel company is going to pop up. But if you're, it's Caroline missing, Richard. Caroline, if you'd like to just um, unmute and tell us something about a fossil fuel company from this point of view. Yeah, and I, hi I, everyone. Can, and can I ask you to keep it like one to two minutes? That would be wonderful. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no problem. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, I'm, I'm having recently left a, a company that I was with for some time. Um, I guess I tried to play a role as a bit of an internal change agent. And, and what I increasingly found is that the, although the company was sort of, I guess, doing best efforts to um, sign up to net zero and um, adopt a lot of sustainable um, principles, increasingly the messaging coming from the CEO and the executive was a world apart from actually what was happening with younger staff, more purpose-driven employees. And at the end of the day, the rationale has always been, um, well, we need to um, look after our shareholders. In, despite the fact that there's a growing number of activist shareholders, still um, the financial returns tend to um, you know, outweigh um, other considerations and and I said for me that is what is sort of the crux of the problem at the moment that's holding back many companies where you've got a huge number of employees that want to change but actually the um, the shareholder return mindset um, is is really um, um, you know the biggest problem we've got in society I think at the moment I've just started working for a public benefit corporation that's dealing with nature-based solutions. All the employees have ownership of the company and it is just a completely different scenario. So it just shows you that there's ways that it can be done. Um, but, you know, I really think we've got to break the, um, the, um, the, the public listed company structure that we've got at the moment. That's fantastic. And I'm, I'm just so happy for you that you, 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 you we can feel it in your voice. And like, I'm in a different space and actually everything you just said is so relevant to what we're going to come and talk about the design of enterprise itself can I ask you to say one more thing because it's so interesting you're saying the 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 leadership or the the senior management of the company were increasingly uh, just so different in voice to the younger employees and it that's such an interesting tension or opportunity and can you just say something about what you felt among the younger employees and whether or not they had their their interests and concerns had any traction with that senior leadership or not? Well, it definitely had traction because growing um, challenges around well, concerns about employee retention and actually what was a company that used to be able to, in the UK, get the best graduates from the Russell Group universities and around the world, 
um, more so in, um, I guess, the, the global north and the global south, was starting to really struggle to attract talent. So I think that was one of the, the warning signs. The company's always been um, challenged by NGOs. Um, but I think what I did see, though, was that a lot of the senior leaders started to have you know children of their own and, and being challenged by them and and in a way often talked about what they wanted to do but how they felt hamstrung and I think it was on, it's only sort of a few remarkable individuals where it felt like something resonated a bit to the point you made earlier about having some sort of personal epiphany it took something like that for individuals to think I will try and um perhaps work harder to really change things. But um, otherwise, I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people get tied up in their own, you know, uh, sort of, you know, feeling of personal entitlement and the financial framework they're in with their own salary, that they also don't see another way out. And I think uh, without sort of looking at gender stereotypes, what I also started to see was a lot of females start to look at a certain stage of their career looking for more purpose and we're very aligned with actually a lot of the younger um, staff joining and making decisions to sort of leave the organisation. There is so much in what you're saying. <laughs> uh, incredibly That's why rich. I'm on a donut economics <laughs> course, Kate. <laughs> but it's so, it's just, you just shared so many different angles. It's, it's fantastically rich. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, if you'd like to, uh, Esteban Echevarria, to, to talk about the consumer products company paper tissue if you'd like to and just share something about it in respect again to this uh, framework um, first of all sorry for my english i i speak very bad english anyway uh, i used to work in that company for about 30 years as country manager the, uh, selling diapers and tissue paper and paper products then i moved to sustainability and I start measuring the impact of the post-consumer waste. And was one day per year of the total waste of the world. So it was huge. So we were trying to convince the company to start doing something for post-consumer waste in a disposable product like a tissue paper or like a used a baby diaper product. It is possible. There are some small companies doing that in New Zealand, for example, but they, they are not really interested in that. That's, that's the real uh, yes. reality. Yeah? Yes, yes, thank you. And I'm gonna ask one more person, um, because I'm gonna keep an answer. Michael Lennon, he says he's got an anecdote contrasting export performance of US corporates versus German local work. This sounds great. Come on, Michael, give, give us your, Michael Lennon, give us your anecdote. It sounds like a wonderful comparison. Sure. Hello, everyone. I was, uh, I live here in Washington, DC, and um, was basically um, advising some uh, local policymakers around um, how to be investing uh, as, as China was becoming a competitive uh, performance benchmark. Uh, whether whether or not the German approach or the American approach. The American approach being that you globalize the supply chain as far as possible out. Uh, uh, the German approach being that strong worker-centric model of putting, um, uh, concentrating in every local region the highest value add in each town. And, um, and that so in Germany, they might do the most advanced work and everything else got uh, outsourced on the food chain. In America, the whole food chain got outsourced and Germany continues to be a net exporter to China. The US does not. And that's been a hard reality for, for the US to face. It's like, oh, maybe we're, we need to actually retain the capacity to do these things or we, we don't. Yeah, yeah. And so all of these examples bring us back actually profoundly to ownership and finance and expectations and, and, and what Caroline was saying about even individuals saying, I, I want to do differently, but I feel hamstrung, I feel trapped by the shareholders, by those demands. Great, okay, thank you all of you for sharing on those. Uh, and I'm gonna ask people to share more things later, if that's okay. Um, I'm going to return, you can still see my screen, can't you? Um, I'm gonna come back to here. So, 
can business move? We're not seeing your PowerPoint. You're not okay. seeing my screen. Okay. Luckily, you told me that. That, that could have been bad. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thanks for telling me. Right. So can business move into the donut? We just heard three examples of companies, uh, di di different tensions, and more people were placing great examples in the chat. Can business do this? When I found myself first starting working um, and having conversations with companies in things like sustainability leadership for uh, they'd often want to, to, to bring their products. And, and the idea was, you know, put your products on the table. Let's talk about designing your product. So I don't know, what have I got around me? A pair of sunglasses, you know, what kind of plastic is this made from? Now, is this recyclable plastic or not? And what could happen to this plastic? And, and, and the workers' ethics and the wages and the terms of condition of where this was made and what kind of packaging. So very, um, very much focus on product design. And gradually, gradually, it became clear to me and to the team at Donut Economics Action Lab. It's like, we can talk all we like about product design, but actually what we really want to talk about is about business design. We want to talk about how you as a company are designed, because that is actually what's going to tell us the most about whether or not you can transform, about whether or not you can become regenerative and move that way or become distributive. And so I began what I started calling very playfully of corporate psychotherapy sessions in the sense that you know if you if you you sometimes hear people saying you know I, I i have all these difficult relationships in my life and i need to go and see a therapist to help me and if you go to therapy over time the therapist will make you realize oh it's not all about them it's also about me and i need to look at myself and think about how i am and reflect internally and I worked at Oxfam for a decade and worked on labor rights and global supply chains. And when we talked to some of the major companies, they'd say, well, it's very difficult for us because you see, as a retailer, as a brand, we're sourcing from factories all over the world. And these factory managers, I mean, let me tell you, they don't do this. They don't like all blame, blame, blame out. And we worked with them and said, hang on, you need to look at your own practices and your own relationships. So this is that same activity of let's look at inside, let's look internally to the company and ask how is the way that you are designed and purposed in the world shaping the relationships that you create and shaping the effects and dynamics that you generate in the world. So I began by saying let's look into the deep design enterprise and again let's listen to what enterprises are saying and, and make it very very stylized and simplified. On the one hand there are companies that say well Here's the overriding question of our business. How much value can we extract from this enterprise? 20th century was dominated by a lot of this. And we can all think of companies, and we've just heard some stories of some of them. We can all think of companies that operate like this and boardroom meetings run like this and reporting goes like this. This is what it's about and this is what we celebrate. But there are other enterprises, other businesses that exist in the world and indeed have existed for a long time, some of them, that ask a completely different question. How many benefits can we generate through the way we run this enterprise? And it goes back to that point I said, when some companies see the donut, they say, oh, we, we exist to bring sanitation to the slums of Nairobi. We exist to create community here. We exist to clean the air. We, we, the reason we set up a business is to sequester carbon by creating timber built housing. Are we, we're just using business as a model. Sure, we make profits, we have to, that's what makes us a business. Otherwise you can't open your doors next week and next month and next year, but we're not here in order to make profits. That becomes a condition for the purpose that we have. We're just using business as a vehicle for what we want to do because we think it's a really good vehicle for the change we want to make happen in the world. So we can all think of enterprises on both sides of this. And I actually felt I heard Caroline just going, I used to be there and now I'm here. And just that, that personal uh, sense that she just radiated and like, oh, I've shifted. Now, what is it? What is it that has some companies on one side and others dancing on the other? And can they move? To me, this is actually the really fascinating question. Can a company move or do people have to move from companies? So what is it that defines the difference? It is. I believe something we can explore through these five design traits and they will look familiar because they are the five design traits we also brought in the conversation with cities. Now I first learned to think in this way from the brilliant thinker Marjorie Kelly who wrote a fantastic book called Owning the Future and Owning Our Future 
about business design and I really recommend that book if anyone's interested. So I'm going to run through these core characteristics of the design of an enterprise, its purpose, networks, governance, ownership and finance. And then I just invite everybody to have in mind a company that you know, one that you love or hate, your CEO, you're the newest employee, you've just left. But have in mind a, a company and think it through, does this make sense, does this make sense to me of that company? And I also say to all the students I teach in, you know, whether they're doing MBAs or studying any subject that relates them to business, keep these five design traits in your mind. And as you go in the world, or as you think about going into employment, assess that future employee of yours. You're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Assess them against these five design traits, because if you're going to give your energy to a company, be, be sure and be confident that that company can be part of transformation. And this will tell you whether or not they can. So let's dive in. Purpose. You hear a lot of people talking these days about, oh, it's all about purpose-led companies. Purpose, and we hear as purpose consultants. Okay, purpose, fine. By the way, it has to be backed up by everything else. It is not enough just to talk about purpose. But of course, the purpose of the company is crucial. Why are we here? Why does this enterprise even exist? What is it in service to in the world? And I think some companies are having some very, very existential questions and discussions around their purpose and how they can repurpose. And is it just a, a, a rebranding or a deep repurposing? And one company I think must have had some really interesting bordering questions is Danish oil and natural gas, Dong Energy, which was a classic fossil fuel company. And they decided at one point that they were going to move out of being about 85% fossil fuel and 15% renewable energy. They wanted to gradually shift in the other direction. But what I think they really did was look up a level and say, well, maybe we're not an oil and gas company. We are a, look up, we're an energy company. And actually to be fit and belong in a regenerative 21st century economy, the kind of energy we want to be generating is not oil and gas because they moved far faster than they ever imagined themselves and very rapidly became 100% renewable energy. They got completely out of oil and gas, got totally in, into renewables, wind turbines, and so renamed themselves Ersted. That is a company that's transforming its purpose by actually looking up a level and realizing that if we still want to be an energy company, we need to completely change what it means to be providing energy. But there are so many companies that are deeply thinking their purpose and how can we repurpose ourselves? So that's often an entry point, and again, I hear a lot of leadership consultants talking about purpose, but it's not enough on its own because it has to be underpinned by all the other design traits of an enterprise. So let's go to the next one, networks. And this question asks, what networks are you part of? Who are your suppliers? Who are your customers? Who are your industry uh, ecosystem? Some that you might think are competitors, they might turn out to be your allies, they might turn out to be your future collaborators in a circular economy. Crucial to think this through. What networks are you part of that are actually pulling you back into that degenerative and divisive uh, form of enterprise? And what networks are you part of that already enable you to pivot forward and that will hold you to your stated purpose and your values when the going gets a bit tough? And some networks, I hear people, again, in the, in the world of um, business lobbying and allies and colleagues of mine over the years have said, you know, organizations like Business Europe and CEFIC, which is the um, European Chemical Manufacturers Association, spend millions every year on lobbying in the European Union, lobbying to stop the commission from introducing this or that legislation. The American fuel and petrochemical manufacturers, in fact, I think Shell left, even Shell left saying, we no longer want to be associated with that because actually we want to be seen as a more um, progressive company than what this network stands for. So there's always a first question of which networks are you going to move out of? Which customers are you no longer going to try to serve? Which suppliers will you no longer use? Which company will you no longer keep because it's holding you back from the purpose you aim to have? And what company will you choose? Will you be part of the Renewable Energy 100? Will you join the Fair Tax Mark? Will you become part of a Circular Economy 100? What other networks can you be in? One company that now bring it down to the level of a particular company, one company in the UK that I, I know of that really uses that power of networking well is Good Energy, which is a 100% renewable energy company. And they intentionally build very strong relationships between their customers, householders, whose electricity they supply, between their suppliers, which might be communities um, and, and 
uh, local farms, people setting up renewable energy supply between their industry ecosystem, like the recharging points across the nation, that together they will make up an ecosystem and their owners. They are 60% owned by their customers and they are actually one of the first companies, I think in the UK, first energy companies to be crowdfunded. So they launch themselves through crowdfunding, knowing that our customers so deeply share our values that they are going to want to own a tiny share of our company. And that means that we're owned by the very people who profoundly share our values and that holds us to those values. So purpose and networks now to governance. Now governance of course covers a massive range of things, but let's just simplify and say, we could be talking about the principles, the rules and the practices by which the business is managed. We could be talking about the metrics of success and the incentives given to staff. And we could be talking about the culture and norms of what it's like to be part of this enterprise and how decisions made, how things get done, who has voice in the room. I think we've already heard from Caroline uh, examples of companies that feel that they're almost governed by shareholders, governed by that quarterly report that's put out every three months on how the company's statistics are doing. And if you talk to a uh, chief financial officer of a major multinational company, and I've, I've had the fortune to have really good conversations with some of the years and say, look, we love to transform. Just like Caroline was saying, we'd love to become regenerative and build ethical supply chains. But every quarter, I've got to show that we've got growing sales, growing profits and growing market share. So where's the room for that? We are held to such short financial timeframes. Where is the room for transforming? We're in such short loops, we can't think long. On the other side of the spectrum, there are initiatives and designs that people set up that aim to precisely overturn this short trap. So if you're shareholder owned, how do you get out of that? And of course, one of them is to be a B corporation. So you can write into your articles of association a, a declaration that we are here not only to generate profits for shareholders, but also for social and environmental value. So it's a way of saying we will not be beholden to this idea of fiduciary duty that we must maximize for the shareholders. There are other values and other stakeholders whose opportunity and value we care about. So it's one form of distributive design. Another is the economy for the common good, which was founded in Austria uh, by the regenerative economic thinker Christian Felber. It's become a big movement, particularly strong in parts of Austria and Germany and in Spain. And the idea is to say that individual companies can say, right, we're going to actually sign up to the economy for common good. We're going to do this, the balance sheet and the scorecard and rate ourselves and have somebody come and audit us and rate us in terms of our social performance, our ecological performance across a wide spectrum of things. And we get a rating and it's not going to be perfect. It's definitely not going to be perfect. But we've, we've now decided to be transparent about this and we'll publish it. And we then can show that we have set ourselves a benchmark that is above any nation's laws, but that we're going for this higher benchmark and we commit to that. Another example would be a community interest company in which is legislation brought into the UK, which means you can set up a company, but that it's got an asset lock on the money that goes into the company. So in fact, Donut Economics Action Lab that my, my co-founder and I set up is a community interest company. So it means that the money can never be taken out and paid out to individuals or to shareholders. It's locked into the enterprise. And if, it, if the enterprise is dissolved, that money must be passed on to similar intentions and purposes. So just some examples, and I know I'm brushing over governance. I'm sure many, many people could bring more things. And I'll invite you to hold that and take it into the breakout sessions where you can just bring so much of your own experience into so many different ways that this governance challenge can be addressed. Let's go one level deeper to ownership. And for me, now we're getting, I, I, again, like, like the psychotherapy, the, the most profound things lie deepest. So we need to talk about ownership, how a company is owned. Because whether it's owned by its founder, by its employees, by the state, by venture capital or shareholders, have huge implications for how it's operated. One example of company ownership, Shell, this is just a, a recent, something I've recently found online, is like the, the, the quarterly transactions of its large institutional owners. So the green arrows are some of those large institutions buying an increase in shares and, and the red ones are them selling. So the, the ownership is constantly shifting. And of course it's shifting in response to expected market returns. And some people say that we shouldn't think of companies as having shareholders. 
because they don't often hold them for very long. We know that over the years, the, the, the duration of shareholding has actually got shorter and shorter and shorter. And some people say, no, call them share traders because they're not shareholders. They're actually sometimes trading them within nanoseconds. So that's one form of ownership. I'm putting on one side as an extreme and another side, El Puente that I showed earlier that had that shared governance. It's got um, 800 shops, 800 action groups, 40 producer organizations all around the world and it's owned 20% share of each of its different stakeholder groups own its 20% share. So it's fully owned by those who are fully invested and involved within the enterprise. Completely different ownership model, completely different financing model and financing opportunities as well, of course, but utterly different design reduce, produces utterly different outcomes. Because how an enterprise is owned, and I've just put a scatter of possibilities here, and you can see that some things, state owned, private equity, family owned, these could show up on both sides. I'm definitely not intending to say that this is good and this is bad. They can show up on both sides of the line, but how an enterprise is owned, of course, crucially shapes what sits at the bottom of this signboard and is the most powerful, it's how it's financed and what that finance is expecting and demanding. And whether that finance in simple terms is saying, I'm here for the short term and high financial returns. And if you don't deliver them, I'm out. And that's the share trader. Or I'm here and investing in you because like you, I'm committed for the long term to the social environmental value that you're generating. That's why I'm here. And yes, I want a fair financial return. And what's fair is a very existential 21st century question, but I'm here with you for the long term. So these five design traits, have amazing uh, possibilities between them. And again, it's an excellent exercise to sit down as a company, as an organization, and indeed, whether you're a for-profit or not-for-profit, I'd say any organization can sit down and actually go through these design traits and you'll learn a lot about your own organization and what's holding you back and what's enabling you to pivot forward. And I want to just give two examples of enterprises that I've been really interested in watching over the last few years, because, there's the big question of can large multinational shareholder owned enterprises become regenerative distributed by design? Can big business do the donut? You could, we could say the jury's out. We could say that the, the, personally, I'm finding it very hard because I've never seen an example of this. So if anyone has one later, bring it up in the breakout groups, but I'm going to tell these examples. So Unilever under the leadership of Paul Pullman, who I have respect for in many ways. Paul Pullman gave Unilever a regenerative purpose, the sustainable living plan. It's about health, it's about communities, it's about using soap and products to improve people's health and their self, self, um, their self perception. So very, very purpose led um, intentions around what the enterprise is doing. He took it into regenerative and let's say progressive networks of we mean business or the renewable energy 100 so moving in alliances and being part of putting forward progressive business propositions whether at the g7 or the world economic forum being part of a public visible movement of enterprise and governing it differently using metrics saying well actually i'm not just going to talk about our, our share price actually we're going to reduce our use of water we're going to reduce our carbon emissions we're going to commit publicly to these metrics that we set out, they had about 60 of them. And of course, on his first day of his job, he said, I'm gonna ditch the quarterly reports. Uh, as he later said, you know, I, I did this on my first day in the job because I thought they can't sack me on the first day. So the first day I'm just like, we are not issuing quarterly reports. It means you then go to half yearly reports. But he said, if you're, if you're invested in Unilever and you want quarterly results, you're invested in the wrong company. This is not why we're here. We only want longer term investors. So some really clear signs on purpose and networks and governments moving into that direction of regenerative and distributive design, moving towards being an enterprise that actually helps to generate social and ecological value. But Unilever is owned by shareholders in the market. And two of the enterprise organizations that own shares, Kraft Heinz and 3G Capital, decided you could say, as people sometimes say inside the business, they, they were leaving too much value on the table, that there was just far more value that was being given to all these purposes that could actually be translated into shareholder returns. And that's why in February 2017, these two 
companies launched a hostile takeover bid to try and take over Unilever. You might remember it. And it was a big battle of whether a Unilever would be bought out or not. And in the end, they managed to ward them off and it didn't get taken over. But many more people say inside Unilever, the managers were actually told, no, we now actually need to show a stronger profit return. We need to pull back from this generative focus and messaging, and we need to show more mainstream returns from within the company. So that's a really interesting example. Then much more recently, along comes another one, Danone. So under the CEO, Emmanuel Faber, it was given a really clear purpose. Uh, the French government introduced legislation saying you could be an entreprise à mission. So with that clear statement of purpose, and again, a bit like uh, Unilever, having very clear purpose of all the brands and, and the intention of being a good a force for good in the world. Moving in, again, in uh, progressive networks, renewable energy, 100, um, being part of a biodiversity movement. Interesting governance. More and more brands were being made B Corp brands. It was on the A list, of, so triple rated by the Carbon Disclosure product, Project. And uh, the, the CEO began to list the carbon adjusted earnings per share. So reflecting in market prices, the actual real carbon cost of share price returns. So some very innovative things, but again, shareholder owned and along come two so-called activist shareholders, Bluebell and Artisan. And in March this year, again, the CEO was ousted from being chairman and, and of the board and the CEO. Now, of course, there's many, many complex things going on behind these stories, but I found them both really interesting because both Unilever and Danone were examples people will very often give of progressive big shareholder owned business that look business can be for good and that it does pay and it is possible and this is happening from within. And yet, why is it in both of these very well known cases, we see the reversal, we see that pullback by mainstream finance, mainstream business interests away. Again, I really invite you to take this into your breakout group discussions. So let's pull back and I offer you this signboard as a canvas to think and play and put here any enterprise you like, whether it's Unilever or Danone or one that you know really well or one that you don't yet know well and you want to research. You could put an enterprise here and ask which design traits of this enterprise compel it to be extractive or encourage or entice it to continue to be extractive because there are going to be some is it the way it's purpose networks governed owned finance what is it that's actually holding us back and which of these design traits already enable this enterprise to become transformative and to actually transform itself what's already on our side what we already got going for us that we can actually live leverage and do a lot more with what would be the easy change that could be brought about? Now, we could dive in here and spend a long time exploring this. And actually, about seven years ago, I, I was at a workshop with Unilever staff and did this on the table. It was fascinating. To, and to, I set it out and, 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 and just said, go play. And it was amazing, the conversation that this released. And again, you're never in one place. We actually started putting multiple objects on each of those arrows saying, well, the CEO speaks here, but middle management incentivizes here. So again, I encourage, explore. But it's never just the enterprise, is it? I mean, enterprises don't operate in a vacuum. They operate in a regulatory environment. They operate in an industry environment. And so I'm just going to add another layer onto this, which is to say, let's just recognize even just for now, let's bring in the regulatory environment of enterprise. So an enterprise is situated in a locality. It could be a city or a region or a province. It's in, within a nation and it's within an international context. And so we can also ask which contextual factors whether it's the city or province or nation or the international regulatory environment are compelling it to be extractive, what's pulling it back? And again, what in that wider context is giving an opportunity to pivot forward? So here's a couple of examples I could place on here. So that European Chemical Manufacturers Union Council, I could say from people I know who do lobby work in or do corporate analysis in Europe would say, this is. This is the organization that's actually paid the biggest amount. I think they pay something like 12 million euros in lobbying the European Commission in 2017. So people against corporate lobby would say, I'm gonna put them there at the international level. The network that they hold is pulling mainstream European business back into degenerative design. In terms of governance, 
In the UK, we have under corporate law section 172. It's very well known because it, it much more than many other European countries, it very seems to be strongly worded in favor of shareholders. And it doesn't do nearly enough to say companies have a duty to go far beyond just returning value to shareholders, but actually a much wider social environmental value. Other countries have much, much clearer legislation on this. So the UK national governance is pulling companies into that old extractive direction. And finance, many people would say just the, the power of these international stock markets and shares, trading, the, the narratives, the norms and the culture around it is just utterly preventing companies that are owned in this way from transforming. So there's are three things you could place on, on the degenerative side. I'm gonna do three on the other side. Entreprise à mission in France, the creation of this possibility, like the creation of a community interest company in the UK, means that there becomes now a new form that we can organize around and, and associate with and transform our purpose. Um, in Stuttgart, the city of Stuttgart has said, we are going to actually recognize that endorsement and their auditing by the economy for the common good and businesses in our city that have done that audit and have got a good enough score actually get subsidies, actually get beneficial treatment by the city. So the city have embraced that very high standard. And then uh, we've got the Global Alliance on Banking on Values, which is an association of hundreds of banks that actually have purpose and value placed at the heart of their bank saying we want to be the beginnings of a new kind of finance. So again, if enterprises are looking for a different kind of finance, that's a network that's beginning to offer it. So you can place lots and lots of things on this frame. Let me pull back before we go into breakout groups. We invite business to the donut table. Yes, you can put your products in the middle of the table, but actually we really want to put the design of business itself there. We can ask, where are you on the corporate to-do list from doing nothing to do your fair, do what pays, do your fair share, do mission zero. It turns out maybe we could be doing the donut. What would that mean? It would mean aiming to be regenerative by design and aiming to be distributed by design. And the world of business is only just really beginning to explore what that could be. We're only just moving towards those possibilities. And then we have to recognize that it's about the design of business itself, its purpose, networks, governance, ownership, and finance much of which can be shaped within the enterprise, but every enterprise exists within a big context and therefore is also either pulled back in the old direction or enabled to pivot forward, depending on the regulatory and cultural possibilities of that context. So, we're gonna go into breakout groups because I hope that this has just generated so many thoughts and ideas that people want to express and there's hundreds of us on this call at once and we can't all talk about it together. So we're going to put you into breakout groups so that you can have plenty of space and time to explore this. So here's how we're going to do the breakout groups. Each break, that we're, since this is our third week together, I'm up, upping the ante a little bit and upping um, what we can do here. So each breakout room this week has two slides to play with. You might only want to fill in one or the other, depending on where the energy in your group goes. The first slide is around bringing examples of individual businesses and enterprise. So if you want to work on this slide, which is just almost plain, then you would say, I want to talk about this company or that company. And you could put examples on the slide of how that company is designed, either degeneratively or regeneratively and share with the others in your group. And you could, of course, put many companies on this. It's not just about one. You could also, and I'll come back to that in a moment, you could also use this slide and say, no, we want to talk about the company, but we want to talk about the local, national and international regulatory environment, because actually that's what really matters too. the context in which business happens. Business cannot alone transform itself. It needs to be transformed by the much wider context. So each group will have two slides. And that means you, you have to follow not just the number of the slides, one, two, three, four, that you can see down the side of the screen, but the big yellow number in the corner of each slide, look for your group number. So we're going to give 30 minutes because there's so much to talk about here. There were two slides per group, as I just explained. Now, here's the, here's the trick that we all need to do together to get this right. This week, so that we don't have the breakdown of the Google slides that we had in the first week, this week there are four links. OK, so if you find yourself going into a breakout room one to ten, you're going to click the first link and it says link one to ten or 11 to 20 or 21 to 30 or 31 to 40. So make sure you get the right link. And Richard is very going to kindly put those links now in the chat box so you can all see them. Find your breakout room, click on the right link and then go to the numbered slide. 
fingers crossed this is going to work. Again, one person in your group, share your screen so that everybody is seeing that one screen. You don't all need to log into these slides. And then one or two people within your group might say, hey, I'm happy to type down everything that everybody else says so that not everyone in the group needs to open them. I think we'll be fine. Should I open the rooms? Uh, in a moment. So okay. you're going to bring back insights to share in the chat. I know there's going to be a lot and I hope we've got plenty of time just to listen back examples that people have wanted to bring. We won't be able to go into long, long corporate stories, but what we want you to bring is the insights that arise out of that about design and about the transformations that are needed in the world. So with that, you've got your four breakouts. You know what you're doing with your slides. You've got two to play with. Oh, last thing, I haven't pre-made um, text boxes to, to, to write in this week. What you need to do is go up here in the top left-hand corner, that little T is a text box. So if you click on that and you can click on the screen, you can write. So the idea is you can write in lots of little boxes around the screen so you can put your comment in exactly the right place on the slide. You could also, if you want, bring in images or whatever you want to do, but fill those slides in a way that really makes sense to your group. And we really, really look forward to hearing what you bring back. So I'm going to unshare and Richard is now going to put everybody into breakout groups. Here comes everybody, fantastic. Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope you've had really good discussions and explorations of those boards. This is one of those moments where we could of course dive into an hour of discussion of what came out. And because of the numbers we are and because of the time we have, we can't do that. But what I would love to do is just invite people now in the chat box to write an insight that you learned. First, let's take an individual, let's take the, the topic of a, a company itself rather than the wider environment. Think about the company itself. An insight, a really interesting case study or perspective that you just learned and that you've come away with enriched by because of the group that you were in. So write something in the chat if you want to about, ah, I've, I've just now really seen that that's really important or always to ask about that or this kind of solution is possible. So let's hear some things coming up in the chat box. Align shareholder benefits with planetary benefits by social pressure voting with their wallets. Metrics for middle managers and staff must match the governance model, right, Ava? Interesting point, yeah. Metrics for middle management can seem an incredibly um, tedious and technical and bureaucratic thing, but of course it massively shapes what the company actually does. So David says, we did a compositional, oh, it's gone off. We did a compositional study. Oh, I've lost it. I'm flying off the screen. We did a compositional assembly of companies that exemplified principles left and right, and there was not always agreement. Interesting. Networks that use social media to carrot mob or shame and name offending companies like Not My Style. So there's so many different things that are coming here. You don't have to have technical expertise to deliver your purpose. You can draw that in from networks you join. That's a great point, Fabio. And that's actually a really great reason why companies should leave old networks that are holding them back and join new ones, because of course that's the place of learning. That's the place of inspiration. Um, so many other companies to learn. Uplifting indigenous communities that already operate in the donut, Eden, thank you. And that would be so interesting to hear examples of indigenous owned and run enterprises that, that operate within the donut. And what is it about the way that they are purposed, networked, governed, owned and financed that makes that so? The importance of long-term financing are very patient capital that allows purpose-driven enterprise mandates to thrive. Yeah. So Naomi bringing up this importance of financing. And of course, we could actually go a whole layer deeper and have an entire session around finance. And what would it mean to create finance that is in service to business, that is in service to life? Crucial, crucial question. The corporate business model is promoted in Minneapolis. So that's a nice example then of a, a state actually, uh, a, a, a place actually promoting um, the cooperative model and rewarding that. And, and of course, there's so much that localities can do. 
highlight actions of people like engine one that brings in long-termism for better profit sustainability interesting so some some example interesting examples and then emmy says can't cover all the traits at once so step by step and that's a really important point of course you can sit down with an enterprise and say okay what can we already do you know you can make a plan what's the five-year plan of transformation what's the one-year plan what can we just do today can we leave this room agreeing that we're going to do this one thing now that we can already pivot on so so many different ways that this can be responded to okay uh, last one I'm going to mention here, seeing post-consumer waste not as a problem, but as potential could be a great idea for new companies. Really nice point, Esteban. Um, yes, wait, if waste is food, who's gonna, who are they going to be the entrepreneurs who say, I'm going to enter the world of business just spotting so-called waste? Look at it, it's everywhere. It's carbon in the atmosphere, it's plastic in the oceans, it's in the rubbish bins, it's in the landfills. And actually that's a phenomenal resource and if i start with that as my starting point what kind of enterprise could be set up that turns that into something ingenious and of course companies like uh, biobean or companies that are collecting back um coffee grounds from restaurants on an industrial scale angela is nodding very vigorously uh that say coffee grounds they're just everywhere people drinking coffee all the time and if you go to you might not be able to collect it from households but you can collect it from cafes and restaurants and hotels that every day are dumping it bring it back you can use it to grow mushrooms you can use it to do so many things so capturing the value as it cascades through different levels okay and now i'm going to ask people you may have started doing this already but start sharing again in the chat box some of those more systemic things so uh not just what the enterprise itself can do but what what insights did you get from the conversation around what the city can do, what the region can do, what the nation can do, and what's international and what's holding us back and what's already enabling places to pivot forward. So let's hear both. Bring bring some of, come on, this is, this is the place to vent. What makes you vent? What is holding the world back from transformation? There's a Norwegian company leading the way on reusing waste. That's interesting. So then that would be, you know, you say, oh, there's a Norwegian company. And then I would always say, hmm, let's have a look at how that company is designed. What is it that's telling us about what's enabling that company to do it? Business as usual thinking, says Joshelle. So yeah, the, the old mindset, the idea that this is how business is done. This is the old ways. It's incredible how we can focus on regulations, but it's the deep culture of what we do and don't do. Ego, says Miguel. Yes, ego can definitely get in the way of having a higher purpose and going through the mindset change that's required for transformation. Lobbying should be made illegal. It certainly needs to be tackled. It's too easy to buy the cheaper version of things that do not take into account real costs. That this is Randy, yes. How do we transform that and then remove this own as well? It's up to the consumer. The consumer can choose. And if people want to choose this, then we're going to sell it. And all the ways that the onus is put on the consumer to make those choices. And Jane Fiona says, move from no but to why not? Yeah. So move from saying no, but we can, but to why not do this? Right. So that's about changing that mindset. Laws reflect values and global goals for the environment and society yes right ceos who have a friedman hayek view of the world says charlie hicks yes friedman milton friedman had a profound influence didn't he in the 1970s when he wrote this essay saying you know the social responsibility of business is to maximize its profits and uh, you just hear and that's as i said at the beginning the business of business is business and it's so widely repeated and it's incredible how deep that mindset's gone as a justification and it's a very convenient justification but how do we then transform that and make it clear that that is not fit for the 21st century somebody mentioned greenwashing natasha yeah with a sad face yes greenwashing and i'm going to talk about that in a moment uh, when i come to talk about how we are working with donut economics and bring it connecting with the realm of business so Thank you so much, everybody, for this brilliant sharing. And I really hope you had good conversations in those breakout groups and have filled in those boards. I can't wait to go and have a look at um, what you filled in there. 
Okay, I'm going to start moving us towards the home run because we've only got 15 more minutes here today. Golly, time flies. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we are. This is where we left off. Some of the core ideas that I've shared today. Put your product on the table, but more crucially, put the design of your enterprise on the table. Where are you on that corporate to-do list? Can we be regenerative and distributed by design? It's about the design of the enterprise and the context in which it operates and this is all needing to be transformed and I was challenging what kinds of businesses can do it and can they transform or will they get left behind that is I think the uh, existential drama of the world of business that is today so these are the topics we've, we've covered and I'm going to come now to the last one which is deals business policy and our balancing of openness and integrity and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to share this today because it's so important for us at Donut Economics Action Lab to share this with everybody here because I know that we're getting excited and talking about doing business but I, I really it's important to put that in context so I'm going to use the framework of three horizons to talk about how we think about the donor and our relationship to business and what is and isn't a, a permitted to happen at the moment so this is our fear and it's a really really real fear you know ever since the donut was first published I've been called by companies big banks you've all heard of fossil fuel companies, big chemical companies. Please, can you do a talk about the donut? Record something for our website, we'll give you 5,000 pounds. Come and give a talk, come and stand on our stage. Can we use it? We're just gonna use it anyway. And if that happens, then the concept is just like this cool thing to play with um, and it gets greenwashed because it, and, and by the way, it's just sitting on a random section of companies. I'm not taking out anything particular against this particular selection of brands, but the idea that major brands say, oh yeah, that's a cool thing to play with. Let's put that on a website. Let's talk about that a couple of times. It then gets greenwashed, like so many other ideas get greenwashed. There's a very, very real risk. And the, the downside of that obviously is one, it therefore doesn't fulfill any transformative purpose. But two, if it gets greenwashed in the space of business, then everybody else who's using it, whether it's in cities or community action, um, or in teaching say, oh yeah, that was a thing it once was, but you know, it got so greenwashed, so I'm not touching that anymore. So it completely degrades and undermines the value of this concept and tool for everybody. So at Donut Economics Action Lab, we've thought really, really hard about how we enable people to use the donut in cities and places, in education, and it's open and use it, but in the world of business, it's different at the moment. I'm going to use Three Horizons to tell you why. So here's the framework of Three Horizons, and we use this a lot when we think about transformation and strategy. I find it a very, very useful device created by Bill Sharp and Graham Lester and others at the International Futures Forum. So there's time on one horizon and on the y-axis is what's prevalent, what's dominant. And there are always three horizons for the future that we can see visible. The first one is what we call business as usual. It's the mainstream, it's the predominant way that things are done now. So it's horizon one, H1. And I'm for the sake of this, I'm going to call that, that's the degenerative divisive economy we've inherited. It's business as usual. It's very, those very first slides I showed, it's how stuff is done, that's normal. And there's something about business as usual that we believe is totally inadequate for our times and so we want it to see it let go and leave this slope down is not a prediction it's a desire it's an intention it's a transformation we want to bring about it's definitely not a prediction of what's going to happen so horizon one we believe it's no longer fit for the future and so we want to see it let go and leave thank you very much you've served your purpose it's time to exit the stage then there's horizon three which I'm calling the space of transformative enterprise and it's small at the moment the seeds a bit of present we can all point as people were doing in the chat box we can point to examples of it existing in the world but we want the intention is to see that rise up and become the new normal so that we have an economy that is based upon distributive and regenerative enterprise and then the third horizon is my favorite one it's the horizon of disruptive innovation or you could call it the horizon of disruption because not all disruptions are innovation. Some disruptive innovation like uh, creating um, a platform on a cell phone, right? So everybody's suddenly connected to the in internet on their cell phone. That is an incredible disruptive innovation that all sorts of enterprises can respond to. COVID is not an, an innovation in that sense, but it's a massive disruption and it shapes 
a, a volcano going off is a disruption, an election is a disruption. It, it disrupts things as normal and it creates opportunities either for business as usual to reinstate and reinforce itself or for transformative enterprise to come through. So we can ask about business as usual. What is um, business as usual? How can we let it, uh, sorry, what is, what is that emerging future and how can we help it arrive and arrive well and bring it forward faster? And what about what is dying business as usual? How can we help it let go and leave? But crucially, how can disruptive innovation be harnessed to bring forward that transformative future rather than get captured by business as usual. And one of the things in that space of disruption we could say is the concept of the donut. It's, it's a conceptual disruption and it's there in the space along with many, many other conceptual disruptions. How does it get played with? How does it get interacted with by business as usual and by transformative enterprise and what's gonna to happen to it? And a donut economics action lab, we always say when business as usual meets a disruptive idea, something is going to get transformed. And it's our job to ensure it's not the donut. It's our job to ensure that when donut meets business as usual, business as usual is the one that gets transformed. Because here's the risk. The risk is that business as usual captures the donut and says, oh, thank you very much. We'll pick you up. We'll, we'll sponsor you. We'll give you a bit of funding. We'll bring you onto our stage and we'll, we'll knock some of the more challenging edges off you, make you a bit more business compatible and, and we'll eat you for breakfast. And actually, because what it's trying to do is continue its life and it'll pick up any resources and assets and possibilities and disruptions that it can then turn into ways of continuing its dominance. So in this scenario, the donut just gets captured by business as usual, turned into corporate greenwash. And as you can see, transformative enterprise doesn't come through because the donut in this case doesn't do anything to serve it because it's been greenwashed. So we're not gonna associate with that. That's called H2 minus. Don't wanna see that happen. What we want to see happen is that the donut connects together with transformative enterprise and actually brings through that transformation much faster. We see a faster let go of business as usual. We see a faster rise of transformative enterprise and that's H2 plus. So how do we make that happen? So this is the background to our thinking. And basically it comes down to saying, when you realize that you're part of something that's a disruption, you might be an organization, you might be a campaign, a movement, uh, there might be an event that you're part of, but you realize that you are one of the disruptive forces or engaged in a disruptive force, you need to think really, really critically and carefully, how do then we uh, interact? How do we engage with Horizon 1? On what criteria, under what conditions? And how do we engage with Horizon 3? So that we find that we are being harnessed for that future, not captured by the old. So, Here's deals policy in space of business. First of all, we have put into the public domain a tool that's on our website called When Business Meets the Donut. And I've presented a lot of the core of that today. In fact, I've gone into some more detail and added some more things there. And any enterprise is absolutely welcome to take that tool and take it into your company and explore what's in there as an internal conversation. But because of the risk of corporate greenwash to us, we have really clear conditions around this. I would really invite everybody on this call to go to our website and read this full policy. Don't even try and read it right now. Don't worry, I'm going to give you a quick summary of the main points, but please do go and read it, especially if you are interested in this particular business angle with the donut. So here are the main points. First of all, businesses can currently only use the donut for internal reflection. That tool, everything I've shared here, you can take it into an enterprise, you can sit at a table and you can have these conversations. And there's plenty to talk about, but it cannot be used in public facing communications by companies on a website, in speeches in presentations. It's not there for companies to talk about publicly. This is for internal work first. Secondly, consultants currently cannot say we are doing donut economics consultancy. We are consulting on the donut because that hasn't even been set up yet or what that would be. So that is not permitted at the moment. Only not-for-profit organizations can host public facing events and initiatives related to the donut. So, and it says in here, you know, if it's a university or a city, an NGO, but a not a for-profit organization. And we ask that no individuals or organizations hold public facing initiatives or events around the business and the donut until we change our policy. So I know that must feel like a lot of things stopping. And I'm just gonna ask at this point that you, anybody think, oh, that's frustrating. We really want this concept to be valuable for transformation, which takes time. And so we need to put in place the team and the tools and the practices that can really make this transformatory work happen. So if you believe in this concept, 
please stand with us and recognize the importance of doing this well and opening up when we are ready to open up. So we plan to open up this very important area of work soon. In fact, we just finished yesterday um, receiving applications for deals, business and enterprise lead. We are shortlisting right now and we are going to be bringing somebody into our team in September. And when we open that up, all of this will then be a space where we can say this is how and when, because we know this can be an important tool with business. And we ask if you want to stay in the loop and when's that happening and how can consultants get involved and what could businesses do and how, please sign up to our newsletter and you will be the first to know. And of course, join Deals community and you will then be inside of it and be the first to know. Okay. Let me pull right back. And thank you for hearing that and I hope understanding that. Last week, we looked at when the donut meets the city. And this week we asked, can we do business in the donut? And there's so much going on in there. I'm really, really excited about next week because I've done a lot of presenting here, concepts and a few examples, but next week I'm so looking forward to bringing along three people who in their own places, at very different places and very different scales have been putting the donut into practice in their place. So the first one is Imi Kaur who is a phenomenal change maker based in Birmingham in the UK. And she has taken the concept with her team of Civic Square. They're taking the concept of the donut and saying, what would it actually mean to do this in the fullest sense at the level of a neighborhood in one of the neighborhoods in the city of Birmingham? And she's gonna come and tell about the work that they're doing. They're just building this, but with such incredible intention. It's the most local scale of putting the donut into practice that I know of. Laura Melcher has been one of the core people in a team in Brussels when the Secretary of State for Economic Transition contacted us and said we want to put the donut into practice in Brussels. She brought on board uh, an organization called Confluence who do a lot of participatory change making in the city in the capital region of Brussels and Laura is going to come and talk about the way and the different ways that they've really interestingly downscaled the donut to place across the region for particular buildings even down to the idea of a particular object. And then Juan Carlos Goyon, I know him because he is a data guru in the city of Amsterdam, but he also happens to be a resident of the island of Curaçao in the Caribbean. And we met through doing the Dutch, uh, the, the Amsterdam donut, and he just took the idea right back home to Curaçao and has worked with the government there to create the first island nation donut in Curaçao. So he's gonna join us too and talk about what they're doing there and how they're using it. So we're going from a neighborhood to a capital region to a nation. Three amazing change makers. They're gonna join us next week. It's going to be them sharing their stories and I'm gonna be inviting you just to put lots of questions for them in the chat box. My job is a great one. I'm just gonna be pulling out your fantastic questions and you'll get to just hear from them what it's like to be in the challenges and the innovations of how this works in practice. So I am gonna stop there and pass back to Jim, but just to say, it's just been a great, from my point of view, another great week of really interesting sharing, so much richness going on in the chat boxes. Can't wait to dive into all those Google Sheets you've been working on. I am, of course, again, gonna share the slides. They will be put together. They'll be shared on the website so you have them. And I invite everybody to have this mental map of five design traits for business in your head for any organization you encounter. Can it be transformative by design? Thanks so much. Over to you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, one thing to underscore about what Kate uh, has just said, uh, particularly in anticipation of next week, everyone, is that at the heart of our masters in regenerative action are not your traditional uh, master's theses where you write something up, but impact projects that will empower you to uh, change the world uh, and become, as Ed Muller uh, puts it, a regeneration first responders. Uh, and so uh, that's just a very important aspect of our MRA. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have some additional uh, core courses beyond Kate's, one of which uh, will be offered by Joel Carboni and the Green Project Management, uh, because we want all the students to actually go through the process of how do you um, be regenerative by design? What does that actually mean 
uh, uh, practically, concretely in real projects. Uh, and so uh, that's something uh, just to bear in mind, because if we're going to make the kind of difference, we not only have to understand uh, donut economics, but as we'll see next week, we need to learn from uh, people that are actually making a, uh, a real difference in the world. Uh, and in that sense, at the heart of, of uh, the MRA is the process of transforming conversations that matter into actions that make a difference. Uh, so that'll be the, the uh, final, the grand finale uh, for our course next week. But then uh, again, as I said at the beginning of the, of the program, everyone, uh, mark your calendars for the following Wednesday, same time uh, on uh, Wednesday, uh, July 7th, where we wanna have an open house where we can answer questions, uh, talk about the impact projects uh, and the various aspects of what we're now beginning to build. We're in discussion around building an incubator accelerator uh, program. Uh, we're talking about internships. Uh, we wanna build a community for everyone in the MRA uh, on our social platform, uh, the UBiverse. There's all kinds of aspects to the MRA uh, that we wanna bring to your attention. So thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you next Wednesday, same time, uh, same station for the fourth and final lecture. Bye for now. Bye. See you then.